Well, thank you for thank you both for the introduction and for the for the invitation, and uh, thank you all for being here early in the morning. And uh, early, o'clock. Well, I mean, not for I, I wake up at six every day, but I uh, mean, I know it's early for some people. <laughs> so, and all I'm going to talk about is joint work with uh, Alan Prato, who's over there. He is a PhD student here in IMPA, and uh, he recently. I got a job at the Federal University here in Rio de Janeiro. And, um, well, I mean, there's this sort of long titles, and I, I'm going to start the talk by just while well, explaining or maybe reminding you of what the cover time is. Uh, well, so uh, what is the cover time? Uh, here I have a random walk on a graph, right? And this is the starting position. And the cover time is the time it takes for the random walk to cover, to visit all vertices in the graph. It doesn't need to be a graph. It could be any Markov chain on a finite state space, right? So well, here you have a, it goes over there. Then it must come back. Now it's covered a new vertex over here. Now it comes back, covers another one, uh, comes back again, again, goes there, and now it's done. It's covered everything, right? So this number of steps until it covers everything is what we call the cover time. Well, th this is a random variable that's attracted some interest in the, the computer science literature. Uh, well, it arises naturally when you think of uh, random walk-based algorithms to explore a graph, to explore some sort of discrete structure. And uh, there's a very nice uh, survey by Laszlo Lovash on applications of cover times and other things related to random walks, which you might want to look at. But it's also a very natural random variable to look at. If you, well, if you like random walks, you like probability in general, it's a very natural object to consider. And uh, it turns out, well, as we're going to talk a little bit about this because uh, Around the cover time, when you look in two dimensions, you have very interesting phenomena that happen. But uh, this is not really the theme of this talk, but it's going to be a nice kind of thing to compare results to. Now, there are many known results about this t. Well, t is the cover time, right, throughout the talk. And there are many known uh, nice known results about the expectation of t. This is just supposed to be an example. So essentially, uh, if you look at all graphs, well, connected graphs, unoriented graphs, within vertices, uh, you can compute, well, more or less exactly, there's, there's kind of low order terms in both, on both sides, the maximum cover time and the minimum cover time. And you can even find graphs that sort of come very close to achieving both these bounds. Right? And uh, <clears throat> a very, very interesting uh, recent result by John Ding, uh, James Lee, and Yuval Perez. Uh, I guess I want to ask yeah, sure. That's n squared. No, that's n squared. Well, it just goes from to one. No, but that, that's, because that's an unoriented graph, right? An unoriented graph. Yeah, so it can go back and forth. So on the cycle, you'd have n squared. So it's not extremal, but it's, uh, and I mean, well, actually, the cycle is going to come up later, because it's an example of a graph in which covering everything is essentially as hard as covering the farthest point. I mean, the order of magnitude of the cover time, the expected cover time, is the, the order of magnitude of finding the, the farthest point from where you start. Right? And uh, well, another very interesting result about the expectation of t is that it's related to, well, the Gaussian free field on the graph. What's a Gaussian free field is, uh, well, it's a, random Gaussian, uh, it's a Gaussian vector. Uh, well, you pin it down at, a, at the starting point in the random walk. And uh, you let the covariance matrix of this vector to be composed of the effective resistances of the vertices in the graph. Actually, it works for any reversible chain, right? But I, I mean, this is not really, again, this is not the theme of the talk. It's just to tell you that there are many interesting things related to cover times in literature. But they're mostly about the expected value. And another thing that's well known is that for many large graphs, it's known that t is concentrated around its expectation. And not only that, but the expectation is essentially n log n times a constant that depends on the graph. So n log n, as you know, is uh, well, what you get an expectation from the coupon collector problem, right? You, you, you take n coupon, well, you sample from a set of n coupons with replacement. How long does it take it to have one of each coupon? That's n log n. And it turns out that for many graphs, uh, n log n is really the right order of magnitude just to walk around everything except that you might have a slightly different scaling parameter here. Not only that, just like in the coupon collector problem, uh, t concentrates around this value. And that, well, that, that 
actually comes from, there is a very general concentration result that gives you a condi uh, sufficient condition for t to be close to x of t. So now our goal today is not really to talk about the expectation of cover time, but uh, well, the main focus is finding the fluctuations of the cover time. So it's, uh, it's really to find the distribution of t around its expectation, right? What's the right scaling is something like, well, f here we're talking about a lot of large numbers, and uh, we want to talk about central limit phenomena. But uh, it turns out that we're going to see that this is very much connected to the shape of the uncovered set. So as you recall, the, the random walk the, it covers one vertex and then it covers another one. It might take a while to cover a new one. And the shape of the uncovered set turns out to be very much related to the fluctuations of the cover time, as we're going to see. And another thing we're going to talk about is about the geometry or the shape of the last point. So you can ask, what's, what's the position of the last vertex that you visit, the last vertex that you cover? right? Uh, or you can ask, what's the position on the last two vertices, or the last three vertices, or anything like that? Alberto, yes. Uh, well, you pick a starting vertex, and uh, you, that's up to you, right? So it's, uh, you can start for any distribution, actually. All results I'm going to talk about independent of the initial distribution. And, uh, right. And uh, well, as we're going to see, we're going to need, we're not going to do this for every single random walk, or for every single finite Markov chain. But we're going to need some sort of assumption on the random walks, which here sort of, I just throw these uh, words at you, locally transient, rapidly mixing, has many potential late points. I mean, that's just, just to tell you that we're not going to be talking about arbitrary things, but rather we need some assumptions on the random walks that we study. Right? But it's going to, uh, I'm mostly, well, at least right now, I'm going to focus on the examples rather than on the general result, so that you understand, sort of get an idea of what's going on. Well, okay, so the, as I said, the first order behavior, I mean, kind of the uh, laws of large numbers for cover times are well understood. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, I'm mentioning this 2D example again, because it, it's, uh, for the, in terms of the first order behavior of the cover time, all the 2D torus, which seems like a, you know, annual graph, very explicit example, turns out to be the, the hardest ex example in which you can compute uh, the asymptotics of the expected value. And this is, I mean, this is relevant, as you're going to see, because what we do is much simpler. So it's, uh, it's sort of, in, uh, already in three dimensions, things change a lot. And uh, <clears throat> the fluctuations of the cover time, as you're going to see, I mean, they're much less understood than the, 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 the expectation. So they, they're known in graphs like the hypercube. They're known in the 3D torus. But it's... I guess that most results on the fluctuations are sort of done on an example by example basis. So there's no, up to our uh, result, there's no general theorem telling you under these conditions, you get this behavior on the fluctuations of cover time. You get this limiting distribution. Uh, well, also, I mean, I, I talked about late points, about the last points that the random walk covers and things like that. Very, very little is known about this. Uh, again, we're gonna, essentially going to mention every single result that's known about this and what comes up. Right, so, uh, okay, let me start with two examples, so just to give you an idea of what could be difficult about this problem. Um, here I have two very different graphs. One is the cycle that Antonio already mentioned. It's a non-oriented cycle, so if you're here, you can walk in either direction with equal probability. Right? And here, this should be the complete graph with n vertices and all possible edges, except that I forgot to draw a few edges, so I'm sorry about that. There's no edge from here to here and a few others. I just realized this. Is, well, I mean, this gets, uh, uh, becomes very tiresome as you draw more and more vertices. So maybe I should have saved up a little bit to be able to draw all edges. But in any case, this, you should think of this as n vertices and n, uh, n choose two edges. Uh, well, as you're going to see, these two graphs are very different from each other if you talk about the cover time. I mean, you remember that I talked about the coupon collector problem, right? You have n coupons, and you sample them uniformly at random with, re uh, with replacement. Well, it turns out that random walk on, on this graph is essentially the coupon collector problem, except that if you've drawn a given coupon, you cannot draw that same coupon in the next step. But everything else is equally likely. So it, everything you know about the coupon collector problem is true also in this case. In particular, you can get, from, just from a bare, bare hands calculation, that the, uh, the fluctuation of the, the cover time here, well, you rescale uh, by n, they center by this log n term, and you get what's known as the Gumbel law. This double, oh, sorry, there's a, that's 
awful. There's a minus sign here missing. So let me just write down this uh, CDF here. So this is what you should have over there, right? Now, as I mentioned already, uh, for the cycle, you have different behavior. Uh, the cover times of order n squared, as I said, it's essentially the time to hitch, reach the farthest vertex. Because once you do that, you're sure to have covered half of the cycle, right? If you're not that unlucky, I mean, with a few more attempts of going back and forth, you're going to cover the other side. And I mean, you can actually uh, essentially compute the explicit distribution from this sort of reasoning, right, of the cover time. So it's, uh, it's much easier. Well, in some sense, it's easier to cover the cycle just in the sense that once you've covered uh, one special vertex, you're almost done. Well, maybe you try a few more times, but then that's it. Uh, now let's talk about something different, which we're also going to talk about today. Uh, I mean, I, I said I wanted to talk about what, what, where's the last vertex to be covered by the random walk, uh, or the last two vertices to be covered, right? Where are the three last vertices? Well, for the complete graph, it's completely obvious that uh, that these last k points are a uniform subset of size k, right? Just because of all the symmetry, symmetries that you have in that case. Well, for the cycle. Interestingly enough, the last vertex is uniform over non-starting positions. I mean, that's uh, not trivial, but it's a very beautiful exercise. You can do it, I mean, as in many other cases, you can do it in two ways. One is just a calculation, and the other one gives you, it's really the kind of the book proof. But uh, it's, yeah, it's something that you might, you know, might want to try it in the coffee break or something. It's a really beautiful fact that the last vertex covered by random walk on the cycle is uniform over non-starting positions. But the last two vertices are adjacent, right? Because, well, I mean, there, if you have two vertices that are sort of disconnected, you must, there must be some stuff lying in between them. You haven't covered these two. You cannot have covered anything in between them. So all right, what we have here, uh, it's the same for k equals 1. It's different for k equals 2 or k equals 3 for the same reason. But it turns out that we're going to see, I mean, as I said, so you have uh, uh, what we just said about the, the complete graph, that you have this Gumbel law for the cover time, and that the last k points are uniform. That turns out to be, in some sense, the generic case. Well, generic corresponds to a large universality class of random walks. And that's essentially the, the main result that I'm going to be talking about today. So well, what, what's in that universality class, right? So, uh, well, here the, is the three D tor. So it is well, you walk on these uh, intersections of lines here, equally likely to walk uh, to step in either direction. If you try to jump out, you come back in through the other side. Right? Uh, well, as it turns out, uh, Bilius, David Bilius from uh, Etah in Switzerland, he in a very recent preprint, he showed that uh, the cover time follows the the Gumbel law. Well, n is the number of vertices. G of d here is parameter. It's, well, the value at the origin of Green's function for random walk on, on ZD, right? So you need uh, D bigger than 2 for that to make sense. And uh, so if you rescale, I mean, it's essentially the same result. This should also be e to the minus C here. It's the same result as for the complete graph, except that you have a slightly different rescaling here. But it turns out that what, uh, he also showed something that's, in some sense, even more amazing. If you look at a time of this form, so this is in the scaling window for the cover time. Uh, well, you can ask, what's, what are the positions of the vertices that you have not covered? What's the distribution of that set? Well, he showed that if you rescale space, so that you fit the torus inside a cube of at length 1, what you have is a Poisson process. And the, the, the expected number of times is e to the minus c. And the Gumbel law actually follows from this, because you can ask, well, what's the probability that you have covered everything? Is the probability that this Poisson random variable is 0, which is z to the minus the expectation. Okay. So this is a much stronger result. And uh, well, one of the things that we managed to do is reprove this result in a slightly stronger form, which is, well, he needed to rescale space right, to, make, to get the Poisson process. Well, we proved we prove kind of a microscopic version of this. And where we don't need, well, you really have kind of uh, 
Well, you sample a Poisson random variable with this mean. Then you choose this number of points uniformly at random, the discrete torus. And the distribution of what you get is close in total variation distance to the distribution of the uncovered set. I mean, that's, that's just one thing that we do, right? So, uh, and uh, well, I mean, as I mentioned, I, I told you already a couple of times about the 2D case. And 2D is expected that you have uh, this uncovered set. I mean, that's these uh, colors here. Uh, white here means what you have not covered so far. And, uh, and different colors mean that you have the points I have covered many, many times, or less times, or just one time. So this is just to kind of press upon you this fact that uh, two dimensions are very different from three. And you might recall that I mentioned something like local recurrence of your graph, or local transience of your graph as a condition to get all the results I'm going to talk about. And uh, it really seems to be the case that the difference, well, it, it is the case that the difference between two dimensions and three dimensions, that this uh, random walk on the torus over here in 2D behaves locally like something that's recurrent. Kind of, kind of no, no recurrent, right? Whereas in 3D, you get those spread out points, a much more well-behaved object, because you have this local transients. And I'm going to see why that is, or at least give some, you some feel for why that is later on. So we can also show that uh, if you look at the torus, and that's going to, as I said, that uh, covers the universality class, right? So it's not just about the torus. It can also show that uh, if you fix an, a constant k and take the size of the torus to be large, the number of vertices, right? And the last k points visited are uniform over subsets of size k up to a small error in total variation distance. So this is telling you that, I mean, you can ask what's special about the last k points that you visit. Well, nothing special about them. They're as uh, uniform as they could be. Well, let me talk about very different random process uh, in which you have exactly the same behavior. So you're going to get the Como law the sort of Poisson cloud of uncovered points, and also that the last k points are uniform. Right? So this example is here. Here you have crosses of a fair twine, right, heads and tails, just an infinite sequence IID. Uh, the, the Markov chain that you're going to analyze is this lighting window here. So you fix a window size that I'm going to call W, and now you slide a window here. That's time 0, time 1, time 2, time 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and of course, this is a Markov chain because given the current state, you're equally likely to jump over here, right? You cut the first one, the first letter, and you add a new one that could be heads or tails uh, with equal probability. So you can think of this as a random walk on an oriented graph. Right, so, and I mean, the cover times are very, uh, very uh, natural thing to consider in this case because it's just, and, I mean, has been considered. So the Gumbel law has been proven in this case in previous work by Tamás Mori from Hungary. At, well, the cover time is just the time you have to wait until you see all patterns of a given length, right? As it turns out, when you make the length large, you get this scaling limit, which is a, the same as for the complete graph and for the torus. And again, there's a minus missing here. But what we add here is that, well, if you look at the uncovered set at a time in that scaling window, again, what you have is a Poisson number of points with the right the mean you expect. And they are thrown uniformly at random in this set, up to a small error in total variation distance. And again, we have that for any constant k and large n, so the size of the window large, the last k patterns covered are uniform up to a small error in total variation. So there are many other things in this universality class. So for instance, say you take, uh, well, you, for, for each n, you sample a random regular graph uh, with degree 3, say, meaning a graph in which all vertices have degree 3 with n vertices sampled uniformly at random from that set. Well, you need n to be even in that case for this to, such graphs to exist. But if you do that, with probability 1, you get a sequence of graphs in which you have the same behavior. You have this Gumbel law. You have that the last k points are uniform. You have that the uncovered set has this Poisson structure. Uh, also for a random uh, oriented graphs, the graphs, that also is going to work with probability 1. Uh, also for hypercubes, for Ramanujan graphs, for uh, well, the Cayley graphs with fast mixing, you can look also at a version of the torus in which you only allow moves that go kind of in the positive directions, right? Also with the periodic boundary conditions, so you have a irreducible random walk. 
And everything's also going to work for dimension uh, three and higher. And I mean, there, there are other things that you can allow. Let me mention that for hypercubes and for a few other examples, the Gumbel law was previously known, as in these two examples that I showed you, the torus and the sliding window. Uh, nothing else that we proved was known. And uh, well, for the other examples, even random regular graphs, which are in some sense, I mean, they're random, but they're very structured. You know that they're expanders. You know that they look locally like trees. There are many things that you know about them. But in spite of that, uh, no such results were known. None of the results that we proved were known for these cases. Right, so it turns out that all we have discussed is a consequence of a more general result, which I guess is a very technical theorem, so it, I won't really have time to explain in much detail. Well, those who are interested, uh, at least part of these results are in Alan's uh, PhD thesis, which I'm, I think you can download from Impulse website. And uh, well, what's the more general result, right? So, well, I'll need some notation now. Well, x of t is just a position of the random walk at time t. As I said, the initial state or the initial distribution doesn't really matter. Uh, age of v is the hitting time of vertex v. So it's the least time, uh, the, the first time at which you visit v. Right? Well, and uh, the cover time is the maximum of the hitting times, right? It's the last time you, uh, you visit a new vertex. OK, so the main theorem we prove, I mean, kind of intuitive description of it, is this. So around the scaling window for t, meaning if you look at this interval where you see the fluctuations of t, uh, these hitting times, they behave as if they're independent exponential random variables. That's sort of the, the I mean, under some assumptions that I'm going to describe later. So I mean, as I said, in all these results, I'm going to get something like this. Well, I have I have t divided by some parameter here that depends on n minus some other parameter here that depends on uh, n. Or And uh, we're going to see that most of the time we're going to get gumbo limits out of this, as I described. But there are a few cases which, or oh, there's at least one interesting case where you get some other distribution here that's non gumbo I'm going to mention that in the end. But in any case, I'm, I, this is the, the scaling window. This is the time range in which I'm interested. Right? So it's uh, uh, times of the uh, kind of h sub n, s of n, plus h of n times c. This is the time range I'm interested. So let's say that you want to know what the distribution of the uncovered set is at a time like that. You fix c, and you ask, what's the distribution of the set of uncovered points? So what, what I propose to you that you do this. You pretend that the hitting times were independent exponential random variables with the same expectations that they have in, the, in your original Markov chain. And uh, you do the calculation, so you get a product distribution, of course, because the exponentials are independent, right? So uh, the probability of a given vertex being the set, well, that event is independent from all the other corresponding events. And uh, you also get the marginals, right? So the probability of a point in the set is something like, uh, so probability that v belongs to the uncovered set at time t of c is something like e to the minus t of c divided by the expectation of the hitting time of v. So you get the marginals, you get the, uh, the product form. And it turns out that, well, under some assumptions, this really is a distribution that you get up to a small error. Okay, okay. No, 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 I don't understand. So you, you, what is the assertion? If you take all the Vs, the set of the H of V behave like uh, Yeah. But I mean, you need to, in, uh, in this time range, and what, sorry. What happens in this time scale here is that, uh, I mean, let's think about the complete graph for a case, right? So I, said, I told you that this time range corresponds to n log n plus n times a constant here. So in the complete graph, any given vertex is very unlikely not to be covered around this time. It's, um, what I'm saying is that around the covered time, the expected number of a covered vertices is very small. It's actually bounded, right? Bounded by some constant. Well, it's essentially e to the minus c. Right? And uh, so you, these 
So you're sort of in a kind of this Poissonian regime where the expected number of uncovered points is bounded and any given point is very unlikely to be uncovered. Right? So this gives you a random set. And what I'm telling you, well, it's precisely this, that uh, if, if you want to find the distribution of the set, not only in the complete graph, but all the examples we described, what you do is you, you com well, you have the product distribution of these marginals here, up to a small error. But I mean, this, this is really special about this time range because all of these probabilities are going to be extremely small. So I'm not sure if I I'm, made this at all clear. But I mean, it's, I should say that, I, I mean, even for Alan and I who proved this result, this, not, this was not at all you intuitive write, at first sight. Yeah, I can write you the statement. The, the thing is that the assumptions are very uh, awkward to state. Okay, no, but if the assumptions, then? Well, the assumptions are this. So, uh, okay, no, sorry. The theorem is this. So, okay, let me, let me write you. Uh, <coughs> so, okay, you have this time scale here. Well, this parameter here, h sub n, s sub n, they are going to be long, they are going to depend on the Markov chain that you're considering, right? But this is the time, right, sort of the right time scale. What, well, let me say what h sub n is. It's kind of the typical value of the expectation of the hitting times. And uh, well, the other one is essentially what you need to, in order to get uh, that uh, the expected number of uncovered vertices at time at, for c equals zero. This is going to be essentially one plus little one, one. So you choose s sub n in order to get this. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to, well, so you can ask what's the law of the u t of c? And I mean, here I'm sort of hiding the parameter n in this notation, right? So the, this uncovered set certainly depends on n. This time depends on n. Everything depends on n. But this is, well, the total variation distance between this law and the product of Bernoulli distributions with, uh, well, so for each vertex in your graph or for each uh, state in your state space, you have, you have a pro, uh, Bernoulli with marginals e to the minus t of c divided by v, and this is small. And this being total variation. Now there's another statement, well, since I got to write in the theorems, let me uh, <coughs> There's another statement over here, which is, uh, <clears throat> well, this is sort of the static statement telling you what, a, a, for a fixed C, what do you see? That's, that's a, what you have over there. Uh, there is a dynamical statement, which is more complicated to state, but let me just say you have this sort of well, which I'm going to describe here for each. the vertex sample exponential random variable with mean mm -hmm. and uh, independently. Right, so this is a process now. Because oh, sorry, I, just, I, I didn't I didn't define the process. So v belongs to the, this sort of u bar t of c if and only if uh, e of v is larger than t of c. So this is what replaces the hitting times, right? I'm saying well, replace the hitting times by exponential random variables with the same means. And, uh, and now I say well, a vertex is uncovered in this sort of well, we call it mean field and covered set, if its exponential is larger than the time. Right? And now the other theorems that the law of u t of c of the original uncovered set 
if you look at any bounded interval, this is close to la of the u bar c of c for the same interval. Well, close meaning you have to put a metric on processes, right? So that's slightly awkward. But you can use the Prohorov metric corresponding to uh, the D space of uh, Cadillac functions. But I mean, it's sort of weird to call them Cadillac because it's space discrete, right? But uh, that's what you get. I mean, up to these technicalities, that's what you get, that the two processes are close. Yeah, exactly. So, right. And, uh, well, okay, and this is the time scale, as I said. So this is just to give you uh, a sense of what this is. Uh, this is essentially a description of this process you bar over here, right? So what a fixed time, oh, sorry, what you get is a product measure, right? It's what, what, what you have over here. And uh, as it turns out, this time range, well, under assumptions, this time range, num the number of uncovered points is always going to be a constant, an expectation. Right, so then each, you can imagine, well, you, you, you probably recall this lack of memory property of exponentials, right? Conditionally on, conditionally, on this event, the extra time you have to wait until you see E sub V is also exponential with the same mean. So you can imagine that each of the uncovered vertices samples an exponential random variable with the mean, though this should be, okay, this is a sort of rescaled time already, so this is not very good notation, but in any case. E, this should be the mean that the expected hitting time of V, well, this is the wrong time scale, but it, what they do is they sample independent exponentials. And if you want to know that the uncovered uh, ver, uh, set at this time over here, you just look at which exponentials to survive. So this is the, the theorem, well, kind of in pictures. And uh, well, the uh, corollaries of this are, I mean, for the, we discussed three problems, right? First of all, what's the distribution of cover time? What this suggests, and it's also, it's exactly the case, that the cover time behaves like the maximum of independent exponentials. So you might recall that the, if the exponentials are RID, you get this Gumbel law, right, that I showed you, the e to the minus e to the minus c. Right? That's the behavior of the maximum of RID exponentials. So if you have a graph like the 3D tors, in which all of these exponentials are exactly the same. Well, that's it, right? Well, here when you take the expectations, it might start from stationarity, just to make things easier. So the expectations are going to be exact, exactly the same. So the law of the cover time should be the Gumbel law because that's the law of the maximum of IID exponentials. But in other cases, you might have different behavior. And I'm going to mention one of those cases towards the end of the talk. And uh, well, the uncovered set is going to have this product law. And what I mean, Poissonian product law, is that, well, as I said, the expected number of uncovered points is bounded, but any given point is very unlikely to be in the set. And uh, the la if you want to know the distribution on the last k points, you need to, uh, all you need to know is the distribution of the k largest values of the exponentials, right? I mean, that comes out of this. I mean, of course, all of this is true up to a, a small error. Right? We're, all, we're always doing asymptotics here. And, uh, <clears throat> well, the examples of chains that I showed you uh, in the beginning, right, the 3D tours, that sliding window when you have heads and tails equally likely, uh, random regular graphs, random regular dig graphs, Ramanujan graphs, Cayley graphs, they're all homogeneous or nearly homogeneous in the sense that these expected hitting times are essentially all equal or almost all of them are almost equal, right? So in random regular graphs, they are not all equal, but most, for most vertices, you, what you see up to, uh, within a large neighbor of the vertex is a tree, a regular kind of a piece of the infinite regular tree. And that's enough to tell you that these ex expectations are essentially all the same, except for a tiny, tiny subset of vertices, the expectations are all the same. And, uh, <clears throat> So in these homogeneous examples, as I said, uh, uh, you should get uh, that the law of the cover time is like the maximum of IID exponentials. So you get the Gumbel law. The last k points should be uniform. Everything is easier to compute, right? If you have a non-homogeneous example, things can get a lot more complicated. Because, well, I mean, you're sort of, this theorem gives you reduction, right? It tells you, well, you want to solve this problem on a complicated Markov chain. 
I give you a simpler object, which is a family of independent exponentials. You solve the problem over there. If you cannot solve the problem over there, then you cannot solve the problem, right? But uh, there, are, uh, there are cases in which even though the graph is very inhomogeneous, you can do this. So here I talk about random graphs that given degrees. I mean, what I mean is uh, you fix the degree of vertex 1, d1, fix the degree of vertex 2, d2, fix the degree of vertex 3, and you sample a graph uniformly at random from the set of graphs satisfying these degree constraints. And under certain conditions that I don't want to get into, we actually get the Gumbel law also for this family. Well, the condition is essentially if you look at the minimum degree, there is a positive proportion of vertices with that degree. That's the condition. So saying, say that the minimum degree in your sequence is 5. So I want the number of vertices with degree 5 to be at least a constant times the number of vertices. That's, that's actually a simple condition. I mean, if you want to talk about the last k points and everything, that becomes a lot more complicated. But because you, well, because it is more complicated. I mean, there's no way around that. Now, there's a very interesting example, which I mentioned that there, there's an example coming up in which you had a non gumbel limit. And that's the example. So maybe I'm going to write that on the blackboard. And uh, well, why not do it now? Yeah, I want to do it now. So you, uh, you remember the, uh, the sliding window chain. Now I want to do it. OK, I want to say this. The probability of heads is some value p. It's going to be smaller than 1 half, so p, uh, uh, heads are less likely. But it's going to be smaller than 1 half when one expect uh, uh, a special value. You take an integer k, no negative, or positive actually, and you fix p to be equal to this value. And, uh, and then you have the sliding window, right? Heads, tails, tails, heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 tails. And you look at the window size w. Well, the time scale in which you want to look at this is this time scale. It's uh, uh, well. Let me say one thing first of all. I mean, strings that have lots of heads, they're the hardest ones to cover if you look at them individually, right? So the hardest string is the one that's all heads, essentially. Well, it is the hardest string actually. But there's only one string that has one uh, that only has heads, right? So there are few strings of that kind to cover. Even though that string is hard, it gets covered quickly compared to the maximum or the, the last one. So you get very interesting phenomenon. All right? And uh, well, you can ask, for instance, what's the uncovered set at this time? Well, the uncovered set is going to have a Poisson number, mu k of c, of strings with k tails, and another Poisson number of strings. with k plus 1 tails. And these two numbers are independent. And given these numbers, the, num the strings that you pick from this set are going to be uniform random, and also from this set. No, it's, yeah, it's the same k as you have over here. And well, from this, you can deduce the scaling limit of the, the cover time. It's the probability that the sum of these Poissons is 0, right? And well, it turns out to be non gumbel but I'm not going to say explicitly what it is. Well, this, the, the, the scaling limit of the cover time had been computed, but the proof doesn't really give you any information about, for instance, well, this uncovered set uh, doesn't give you any information, say, about the last string to be covered. It turns out that there are non trivial probabilities that that string has k tails or k plus 1 tails. And can compute these, well, it can give an integral formula for them. And now I just want to mention quickly what the assumptions are of the results, since I'm sort of running out of time here. Uh, well, we need to work with uh, random walks where kind of you have a relevant subset of states, meaning in the states that you know they're going to survive for very long. And in this subset, you need the random walk, uh, the distribution, stationary distribution to be more or less uniform. So in this case here, the relevant subset is just things that have k tails or k plus 1 tails. 
In these homogeneous examples, relevant set is everything. Well, sometimes you need to work with lazy random walks because otherwise you have mixing problems like periodicity. And uh, you need small, essentially sublinear mixing times, meaning that you need your walker, your walker to lose memory faster than the number of vertices in the graph. Actually, you only need to count the relevant, this relevant number of vertices here. So it's uh, slightly more complicated than what I'm showing you. And uh, well, you need relevant vertices, meaning these last vertices you're going to see, to have expect similar expected hitting times. And uh, the main assumption really is this. Well, it's, I'm not sure it's uh, perfectly written here, but that, uh, well, there are two kind of main assumptions. Uh, one is that if you look at the expected num uh, time to reach one of two points, so V and W, that's strictly smaller than the largest expected hitting time of either V or W. So hitting two points is faster than one. And the other assumption you need is that, well, it's written over here. I don't know why I don't have a formula for it. But it's that most vertices are far from each other, meaning that if you have two, for most pairs of vertices, the probability that starting from here, you get here before the random walk mixes, that is, before it loses memory, that probability is very small. Well, these assumptions are satisfied by all the examples we have here. And uh, well, whatever. And now I already wrote a lot on the blackboard, so I guess I'm just going to skip to the references. And well, the, this is the main one. There's a, we actually have, uh, our lens thesis doesn't really have everything I discussed here, where we, we prove a few other results after he was finished. And we should have a draft on that, well, hopefully in a month's time or so. So, well, thank you very much. <laughs>